Hello, my dear friends, and welcome to Dr. Creepin's Storyteller Community Day 2020, Volume 1. <laughs> okay, so a simple idea. I've had a fair deal of success in storytelling, and um, I thank you all for coming back week after week, day after day, to listen to my stories. And I thought it's about time that I help those out who are just starting out in the game. Smaller channels, but full of ambition and looking for a wider audience. So today I'll be presenting five different stories by a lot of very talented people who deserve more listeners. So, see what you think. Go check out their channels. Like, comment, subscribe, you know the deal. Well, my dear friends, it's definitely time to sit back and relax with your favourite drink and listen. Our opening tale of terror is The Curious Case of Baby Genie by Hyperobscure. This story features the vocal talents of Terror Talks and Musies more than dreadful. Jeannie was born on a Wednesday. I remember this perfectly because her mother died the same day, and her name was Wednesday. She was named after the day, not the daughter from the Adams family, nor the nursery rhyme. I found that to be quite poetic, if not somewhat absurdly ironic. She cried non-stop for hours, Jeannie, not Wednesday. Wednesday died without so much as a whisper, and I couldn't quite figure out how to make that infernal ruckus stop. The nurses were no help at all, too busy mopping up the now bloodied floor and taking care of my soon-to-be dead wife. Baby Jeannie didn't have eyes then, by that I mean they weren't open yet. It's a strange thing to behold when a newborn opens their eyes for the first time, it's like a window to a completely unknown universe, and Genie's universe in particular seemed governed by laws that slightly favored multifarious conundrums. After that initial shock of our first encounter, we soon found our way, Baby Genie and I. The infernal ruckus gradually faded to a discordant, high-pitched screech, invariably causing my ears to bleed. But what can you do? As a parent, you must face these challenges with an unflinching smile, bleeding orifices or not. It shall remain our perpetual responsibility to provide our offspring with the best possible chance for survival. It didn't take long for me to realize that Baby Genie was special. Her terrifying blue eyes would burrow into my mind, requesting the oddest of favors from inside my head. Even as a tiny, mostly stationary baby, all she had to do was shoot me a glance, and I'd come running to do her bidding. Before her intellect developed, it'd be the silliest of demands, of course. A rattle, a change of nappies, some formula, fresh blood from the cat, all things I could hastily present to her without too much of a fuss. We never really settled on a name for her, so for the first few months I called her Baby Wednesday, after her mother, not the day. My wife suffered a cruel affliction of mouth, body, and mind for the majority of the incubation period, and as such our main concern throughout would remain her failing health. I adored the name, though. Baby Wednesday. It felt like a lovely homage to my deceased wife. Baby Genie, however, did not agree. One particular night, I believe a Monday, I woke in the pitch blackness staring into those dreadful sapphire peepers. Genie, barely two months old, had crawled out of her crib, up to my king-size bed, onto my chest. Now gripping my mustache at either side with unparalleled strength, I swallowed deeply and remained motionless. Father, dearest, Jeannie spoke. I wish to inform you that my name henceforth shall be Jeannie. I will no longer answer to the name Wednesday, Baby Wednesday, or any combination thereof. Then she crawled back into her crib, and I could sleep peacefully knowing she'd found her name which in turn meant I didn't have to. That was the first time Jeannie spoke, and curious enough, it wouldn't happen again for several years, or months, depending on how you see it. I suppose she didn't really have to verbally announce her wishes after that. If she wanted anything, she'd just slither into my mind and leave enough breadcrumbs for me to understand. After the aforementioned night, Jeannie grew up fast, I mean that quite literally. In a couple of months, she had matured into the brain and body of a seven-year-old. 
You might raise an eyebrow or two at this statement, and rightfully so, but rest assured, there remains a simple explanation for this seemingly preternatural blossoming. It's just not the answer you'd expect. I came to see my little girl as something sinister. Not that I was a parenting expert by any means, but even I had to conclude that something wasn't quite right about her. She was four months old, by my count, and about seven or so biologically, when she bit off a limb. Her jaw stretched unnaturally as she chomped down on the babysitter's toes. And after the incident, we came to the mutual agreement that perhaps a babysitter wasn't such a good idea. It'd be best if I just quit my job and became her servant full-time. School wasn't easy for her, of course. Too many distractions, too many limbs, and she was the youngest in her class, too, having barely turned six months, or 26 weeks, which strangely enough seems to be a socially acceptable way of recounting your child's age. She never got into any trouble, per se, but I could tell she was exhausted by the end of school days. Too many minds to wreak havoc on, I suspected. Poor little thing. I'd feed her whatever limb I didn't need at the time. A tip of my finger, sometimes half a toe, and she'd drift off suckling on the open wound, bathed in the soothing warmth of our fireplace. Those were good times. Innocent times. She wouldn't allow me to be alone in my head for too long during these trying times. And why complain? Feeling the soft, creeping tendrils of your firstborn squirming around in your brain could be quite comforting. And even when the unimaginable pain forced my body into violent seizures, I could always count on sweet genie to keep me company until the inevitable darkness of unconsciousness swallowed me. But every once in a while I'd resurface from the abyss with an unconstrained mind. It wouldn't last long, maybe five minutes. But in that time, I experienced how life would look without the unending love of my daughter. And it was dreadful, filled with autonomy and decisions. The world suddenly appeared chaotic and disordered. I'd do strange things in those fleeting moments. Things I'd soon come to regret. Like the time I called Nurse O'Sullivan. It was a Tuesday afternoon. Jeannie would have been about five months old, or 21 weeks. She was still sleeping when I emerged from my slumber. I could always tell by the look in her eyes when she was in the other place. Those aquamarine globes would appear quite dull and lifeless, and she'd stop breathing. For some inexplicable reason, I grabbed the phone and dialed the seemingly random sequence of numbers. Hello, Sayoban O'Sullivan said. To whom am I speaking? Evening, madam, I whispered. I must be brief. Do you remember my wife, Wednesday? Nurse Sayoban O'Sullivan was one of the three nurses present when Jeannie and Wednesday traded places. She even attended the funeral and seemed overly concerned with my well-being throughout the somber affair. I kept her reminding her I was a single father now and that I would not leave the memory of Wednesday tainted. The day? Sayoban asked. A patient, I said. My wife. Surely, you remember Wednesday. I do apologize, sir. She seemed rather reluctant to indulge me. What was her surname? Friday, I said. Wednesday Friday. Her father's name was Friday, named after the day, not the fictional character from Robinson Crusoe. And honoring certain traditions, we decided to assume the name as our own upon our marriage. It only seemed fitting. Oh, why, of course. Sayoban chirped. Wednesday, Friday. How could I ever forget? Quite, I said. It's been so very long, Mr. Friday. She said. But I remember. What do you mean? I asked. It's only been five months. She fell silent then. I could hear her breathing. Like a chill, wintry breeze pausing every once in a while, assumedly to regain her composure. Yeah, grisly affair that, she said eventually. One that stays with you. What do you recall of her affliction? The tumor? She asked. It caught us all by surprise. Never seen anything like it. Come again? It ate her up. Her voice trembled. Nothing left in her but rot and... 
decay. Before my thoughts could form into something comprehensible, I was abruptly cut short by Jeannie's violent gaze. She required my assistance forthwith, and I felt it necessary to end the conversation with Sayoban O'Sullivan post-haste. Mr. Friday, Sayoban said with the utmost affection and care. It's been more than five months. It's been ten years. That's quite enough, Father Dearest, Jeannie interrupted. I demand from you undivided attention at once. A child's needs must come first. That's a parent's only decree. I threw the phone into the fireplace, and we sat back and listened to the erratic crackling of plastic and glass melting. It was in those moments of warmth and affection that I would remember how much of a miracle Jeannie truly was. Wednesday, my late wife, not the day, was barren. I was infertile. We weren't meant to create life. But life somehow found us. Who knows where it all started? Perhaps it was always faded. Perhaps it was Wednesday's mental affliction that brought Jeannie to us. My wife used to journey the universe in her dreams, cover vast distances in her mind, visit places unknown to God and mankind alike, meet strange, unliving things. Sometimes she'd talk to them in her sleep, whisper strange names and sing their praise. She had a wonderful voice, Wednesday, harmonious like a forgotten cemetery, cheery as a void sun, vibrant like the end of all things. She'd forget things, though, as a result of her travels, and soon after the memory loss started, she'd slip into her affliction and surface no more, lost in the endless expanse of the forever. I always imagined her joyfully traversing eternity, even after her death, almost like Jeannie set her free. Do you love me, Father Dearest? Jeannie echoed in my mind. Unquestionably, I said. You know now how this will end? She asked. Yes. Be not afraid, Father Dearest. Her tendrils caressed my amygdala. You have served me longer than any other. You shall soon know rest. I simply nodded. There is no pain or regret in passing when you leave behind an eternal legacy. Jeannie will embrace life without me, of this I am certain. She will embrace it and snuff it out of existence, as is her way. If you see Jeannie, please take care of her. That's all I ask of you. Take her in. Hold her tight. Let the glory of those azure orbs creep into your mind, and you shall know hardship no more. You will become the servitor she deserves, the servitor she needs, and that is our only function as parents, fulfill our child's every need, even if that need is to devour the entirety of creation. Who are we to enforce what path they choose? Genie is ready to move on. My body cannot handle her much longer. It is foul and rotten and gangrenous. Funny word, gangrenous. Derives from the Latin word gangrena and the Greek gangrena. Interestingly enough, it has nothing to do with color. Isn't that something? It just means putrefaction of tissues. And with that said, I feel whole again. Hollow in body, perhaps. But my spirit runneth over. It is almost time for me to go. Time at last to explore eternity with my Wednesday. Our next horrifying story is Our Last Days. Written by Philia Noctus and Sir Soothing Voice. And featuring them on vocal. Good morning, Buckeye Nation. I'm Amber Campbell with the National News Corporation. There's a beautiful, mild spring day with an expected high of 70 in the Ohio River Valley. With cold and allergy season in full swing, many people are preparing by buying anything they can get their hands on to keep their noses clean. So stock up. Also, make sure to cover your mouth and wash your hands 
as this new virus going around seems to be spreading like, well, a virus. In our next segment, we learn how to keep rabbits out of your gardens. Kent, back to you. First thing to go was the uh, toilet paper, oddly enough. Then tissues, paper towels, and napkins. It was odd, really, the things people started to hoard. No, when it came to vitamins or anything that actually helped with building up an immune system, however, there was hardly anything even touched, at least in the first few weeks of what was called a social distancing. America was doing their best to suppress the social collapse that was really going on. Social distancing. And social distancing is what they called it. Quarantine and martial law is what it was. The government uses less threatening words the public will be lulled into compliance. The people, not essential personnel, everyday people were sent home to wait and listen for the daily broadcasts with the death tolls and infection rates. Doctors, nurses, and first responders, and people essentially keep a small amount of commerce going were exempt from the quarantine. Truck drivers were given a free pass to drive as many hours as they thought they could to keep food on the store shelves. Of course, they could not sit down to eat at the truck stop, nor use the drive through windows of most fast food joints, but they were expected to keep driving. If you were told to leave your house, the procedures we were told to follow make sense. Wash your hands, wear a mask, wear gloves. Basically create your own personal protective environment. <laughs> it was a great idea. Really, it was, and it would have worked, too. If the public would have been warned in time. My place in all this? One of those drivers. Though, not for food or anything like that. And it always used to be Sergeant Phil Ziegler. No. No. Before all this, I worked for a cash logistics company. Armored cars, private security, stuff like that. We got a set of new trucks a few days before most of the reports of a new virus came in. State of the art and top of the line and safety from anything you can think of. This is how my boss put it. These things were... <sighs> Crazy. It looked like the armored cars we were used to in the shop, a bit bigger looking and actually requiring a CDL to drive, as opposed to the normal trucks. But they looked almost exactly the same. Reading the specs of it, however, there were huge upgrades that were made from the original design. Fully pressurized, vacuum sealed, military grade bulletproof windows, 30 millimeters of tungsten steel paneling decontamination chambers for the box portion and the cabin. Looking back, I think the plague started off known, but on a need-to-know basis. That wasn't the only change either. The bags we sealed off the money in. Thicker than normal. Not too noticeable. Unless you care about the thickness and texture, the things that you hold, which, given my ADHD, I very much cared about it. It was different. Very different. Good morning. I'm Amber Campbell with the National News Corporation, and this is our top of the hour story. The Ohio State University confirms early Wednesday morning the new form of lysivirus is a pathogen A mutation of the Australian bat lysivirus, though surprisingly a weaker yet more contagious variation. This new strain is being called Immortalum terapid lysa. The CDC confirmed that though social distancing will be required of the populace to contain this new virus, Simple preventative measures will easily kill the virus on contact. This includes washing your hands with warm soapy water and using hand sanitizer. Also maintaining good hygiene, a healthy diet, and of course, staying at home will keep us all healthy and safe. Back to you, Kent. Weaker. <sighs> yeah, and that's what it seemed like at first. Uh, it was about three days after that report was aired when the most severe cases started to come in. Rabid humans hiding in dark and closed areas, abandoned buildings, underground sewage systems, caves, basements. Left untreated, the virus inevitably spreads to the brain through the nervous system. At first, it was 
just ferrets or cats that started attacking us out of nowhere. But soon after, dogs and the like were stricken with increased aggression and hostility to be expected from a form of rabies. But nothing to this level. Eventually, quickly, it started happening to people. These people, they did everything that they could to cut you, bite you, grab a hold of you, anything just to spread their plan. One shot to the head, they dropped. I know this because I had to do it. To start, all security companies came together into one main company, Minx World Solutions, or MWS. The entity started working closely with law enforcement, the United States military, and the United Nations. I was just an armed driver for one of the companies that merged together. I was originally told it was an agreement to provide relief as one government entity. It's an extended branch of the UN, so it could work anywhere in the world that was part of it, which soon became every square inch of the earth. I was a part of an immediate draft within the newly combined corporation. I say draft, but everyone who didn't end up sick were chosen to stay. Well, the others were politely asked to pick up their things. When they would show, we either detained them or just killed them on the spot. This was after numerous changes that happened within the company. Our actual uniforms stayed the same, mostly. Dark navy blue and black, red shield patches on our logo. Human cell with a phrase in Latin surrounding it. Salvum faciam mundum. Fac mundum pura. Save the world. Make the world pure. It's a fucking joke. I'm Amber Campbell with the National News Corporation. The United States government has issued a five-day notice to all uninfected persons. You are required to report to your local law enforcement agency for registration within five days or you will be left in the quarantine zone. It is my sad duty to inform you that we lost our own Kent LaCosta last night to the virus. Kent, rest in peace. Stay tuned for the weather. Initially, we stuck with a standard three caliber choice, nine millimeter, 40 or 45 caliber. Pretty soon after uniform change, however, caliber of at least 45 was required. Soon followed by a requirement of a primary firearm of at least 5.56 or 7.62. Additionally, we started using military tech and gear Ceramic plates, instead of just Kevlar. Helmets became a requirement along with tack vests, personal radios, all this plus specialized skin-tight environment suits. High-grade gas masks, like I said. Martial law, whether people realized it at first or not. And all of this we were given all too conveniently. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Amber Campbell with the National News Corporation. This will be our last broadcast as we are being preempted by the emergency broadcast system for the foreseeable future. All information you need for survival will be sent to you via the EBS by the United States government. It has been my pleasure to serve you. Please stay safe and may God bless and protect you. Good luck, America. By the time they did realize it was martial law, they wanted it. Jesus fuck, did they need it. Cases just kept growing of these feral humans. Attacking, biting, and scratching anything that moved. For a while, people were able to fight it off. They were able to create strongholds and keep these things at bay. But a little while after that, maybe a year into this whole mess, something changed. Headshots weren't doing jack shit anymore. Strongholds that relied on it fell in a matter of minutes. Millions fell in a few days' time. And it wasn't until flamethrowers were given to our units did we realize that they were incredibly flammable. It came just in time, too. Again. The hour before we got the new toys. 
We were scouting out the remains of a suburban area in Reynoldsburg, just by Wagner and Broad, a place where I grew up. What I saw that day is going to haunt my every nightmare from that day forward. There was a group of five survivors possibly going out on a scouting party. They were not nearly as equipped as we were, and while our official orders at the time were to protect civilian life that still lived in their normal homes or within their own strongholds, we were meant to open fire on anything that came within 30 feet. Unfortunately, they encountered a group of two infected dogs, and they shot them in their heads with little to no effect at all. I just kept running and running. Survivors just kept firing and firing. And all we did was watch, waited to see what would happen. The dogs disintegrated into a thick cloud of brown dust. And the survivors looked a little confused before letting out a celebration that lasted about six seconds. Six seconds was all it took for that cloud to engulf and kill every last one of those survivors. The cloud was fast, filling the mouths and throats and eyes and ears and old little wounds and anything else it could slide into. A moment later, the blood vessels in the eyes seemed to explode as they fell to the floor, convulsing and coughing and screaming from the pain of the trillions of cells of the virus that just entered their bodies. Their skin turned a dark purple as each and every blood vessel ruptured in their bodies as they laid there coughing. They laid there clutching their heads or the chests. All I could do was watch as they seemed to dissolve before my very eyes. Even their bones fell apart in chunks that soon decomposed into nothing but an addition to the brown cloud. We started moving again right after the last of the body started to fall apart. Just as the outlines of about a dozen dogs started to form within the thinning brown cloud. We encountered a pack of these things. Six of them, this time. After we got the flamethrowers in. They were gone in the same amount of time that we saw those survivors die. Once that flame hit that cloud, it went up like a match at a patch of gasoline. One-sixth of the world's fucking population. And only at the very end, after the virus took about 80% of the world's fucking people. Women, men, fucking kids. Dogs, cats, all wildlife were affected heavily by this. So thankfully, we created a sort of arc system to preserve as many species as we could. But all of that could have been prevented if we just washed our hands. Or stayed at home sooner Fuck if we would have at the very least installed the ethanol showers or sprinklers. All that bullshit. And I only just started to put the pieces together, just as we're cleaning up the rest of these virus hives. Corporal Campbell reporting in, sir. Mission accomplished. The last of the recorded colonies and cultures of the virus have been successfully eliminated. We did it. After all this time, we did it. Do you think I might even be able to get back to my dream job? Yes, sir. But... Yes, Colonel. I understand. I will remain at my post until civilization returns to a more suitable norm. Yes, Colonel. Yes. Over and out. <laughs> the convenient flamethrowers right as we knew... It split into clouds. The knowledge that it invades the nervous system first and spreads out. The calm demeanor that the media attacked the situation with. The social control established once the public looked towards the government and the sudden attack of these terrible creatures. I, I only just internalized it once Corporal Campbell encoded the information to me. I can't thank you enough for trudging through this with me, Amy baby. All of this was them. The government, the corporation, knew exactly what they were doing. They were working to destroy as many as they could while still leaving a skeleton crew of a population behind to rebuild. 
They didn't plan on anyone fighting back, especially now with the rebuilding period. But they didn't expect people to be actively working against it. The immune secretly hiding droves of them underground, but they could keep growing. <laughs> we aren't immune. There's no such thing with these things. There are only carriers. With a supersized virus like this, they grow smart, smart enough to communicate with us. We want to help wipe out the fuckers who did this shit to the world. Destroy the ones who even created the immortal virus. And we will. We will change the world for the better. And eliminate those who don't deserve to live in this new world. <laughs> the damn fools didn't read the warning labels on their damn hand sanitizer, did they? That shit only kills 99.99% of germs. It's time to meet the point zero one percent. Our third tale guaranteed to frighten all is The Coldest December Interrogation by Ronnie14. This story features the vocal talents of Musie's Modern Dreadfuls and Scarecrow Jack from Scarecrow Tales Podcast. My father was killed on duty. My mom worked the beats up until the cancer struck. So I guess you could say being a cop was in the Gore family bloodline and why I worked my way up to detective before turning 30. Detective Jill Gore stayed busy in Tallahassee, Florida. My days split between solving crime and spending what little time I had left with my mama. For the past year, my mom had been in ICU at Tallahassee Memorial Healthcare. The cancer was getting worse, as was our dwindling hope. But the medicine was still there. The treatment was a shot at a miracle. My bad days at work paled in comparison to her worst days. But every evening, we sought solace with each other. Our love rescued us. Like a determined soldier, Mom trudged on. She was a fighter in both the Tallahassee Police Department and now within the hospital's walls. Mom still kept her nice figure, her piercing green eyes and long black hair. I inherited all that. I also hoped I inherited her resilient strength. At 29, I didn't have much interest in dating or settling down. My straight hair was a constant mess. My fashion sense down to wrinkled dress suits or yoga pants. Instead, my obsession was with catching crooks. The drive to keep the Gore family legacy alive. But instead of interrogating rude suspects or studying gruesome crime scenes, I'd much rather be with mom. Even if it was in her bland hospital room, next to her impending deathbed. Those fun moments spent watching TV or reminiscing kept us both alive. The roughest times were the anniversary of daddy's death and the holidays. Christmas cheer not so easy to come by with cancer in the family. The cold weather now felt more bitter, the jolly music more hollow during what was no longer the most wonderful time of the year. This December 3rd was no different. Even with Christmas weeks away, the holiday barrage had already begun. The hospital's decorations and ornaments did little to alleviate my mom and my mood. The Yuletide movies and commercials painful background to our conversations. Rather than celebrating with presents and family dinners, 
the season was nothing more than a somber reminder that another year was about to be over. Another year with no cure. Christmas was a ticking clock counting down the days to mom's inevitable death. To our family funeral. After all, all our other days were Christmas enough for us. Mom and I spent plenty of joyful time together without using the holidays as a last-minute excuse. And we both hated the cold weather. The Florida temperature now gone from hot to perfect to chilly. On top of everything else, Tallahassee had suffered a series of strange, unsolved murders I had to solve. The murders began in late October. The deaths spaced apart without much in common except from mystery. The victims ranging from an old southern white lady to a young mentally challenged Latino man. The causes of death from gunshot to strangulation. There was no way I could prove they were connected. But still, I felt we had a serial killer on our hands. Call it paranoia or gore family intuition. Needless to say, the investigation was just as maddening as the murders. I had no real clues, no support from the lieutenant, no one wanting to declare we had a prolific killer on our hands, especially this close to the holidays. At least Mama listened. She believed me. And most of all, she encouraged me. Going off her advice, I stayed up into the wee hours of the morning, like I was cramming for a big test. I lived off of caffeine, glued to crime scene photos, and a few similarities between the deaths. Transcripts and autopsy reports were the only literature I consumed. And then, on December 3rd, everything came to a screeching halt. Hours after I visited Mama, I was assigned to interrogate Robert Moore, black male, late 20s. His crime? Stabbing his mom to death just moments earlier at Tallahassee Memorial Healthcare, room 200. Moore was being held at the police station, and instead of talking to a lawyer, he made a special request for someone else. Me. The brutal crime instigated my instincts. As did Robert Moore's strange request. Again, there were no clues or connections. Nothing yet. But still, I couldn't help but let my imagination run wild. Could Moore be my serial killer? Walking through the parking lot, the breeze battered me, the cold air enhanced by a cloudy day. Inside, I passed our station's pathetic plastic Christmas tree, its wiry arms weighted down by obnoxious ornaments. No jingle bells played on the speakers, no jolly faces greeted me. By now, the excitement I felt around my mom had already evaporated. Only with her could I escape the dark side of Tallahassee, Florida, the real-life horror I felt compelled to endure. I marched on to an interrogation room. A couple of cops greeted me by the two-way mirror. Now I had my first glimpse of Moore in handcuffs. He was a tall, skinny black man, his eyes wide, Blood still covered his dark suit, his flesh, his face. He wanted to speak to you, one of the cops told me. 
And only you, detective. You wouldn't even let us clean him, a female cop added. Feeling unease, I stared through the glass, right at Robert Moore. He just wanted to come straight here, the cop continued. Even disguised from his vision, Robert still looked straight at me, staring into my soul. Holding a case file, I entered the room. The door slammed shut behind me. Now it was just Robert and I, alone on this dimly lit stage. I did my best to stay calm, keep myself from shivering in the cold room. I sat across from Robert, my face like a blank canvas. No emotions on display, just like Mama and Daddy taught me. Moore's beaming smile pierced through the darkness. Hello, detective. Amidst the bloodstains, he was rather handsome. The demeanor of a confident professor. Maybe one too smart for its own good. They said you wanted to speak to me? I said. Business as usual. I laid the case file on the table. Is there anything you want to tell me, Robert? Robert nodded. Quite a lot, detective. Besides the fact that you killed your mother? Possessing an eerie poise, Robert leaned back. Not so much I killed her. But you did. My sharp gaze never wavered, even if I didn't have a shot in hell at cracking the strange man. Well, Mama wasn't doing too well. What do you mean? She'd been sick. A sadness overcame a face more cool and chilling than this room. The first feelings I'd seen Robert show. I saw her as often as I could. He said. She needed those visits. Robert sifted in his seat. Hell, we needed each other. Flashbacks to my own mother hit me. Robert and I did have one thing in common. But you still murdered her, I said. Robert cracked a weak smile. <laughs> I did what was right. After Dad died, we were both wasting away, languishing in this hell. So that's why you stabbed her over ten times? That's not... Covering yourself in her blood, I pressed on in the clinical tone of a detached doctor. Keeping his eyes on me, Robert entered a tense silence. I refused to relent. You were caught red-handed killing your own mom. Someone you claimed to love. Robert placed his hands on the table, the metal cuffs making a startling slam. Look, I've always loved her, he said, his voice calm but strong. But it was Mama's time. He looked down for a brief moment, then his stare met mine. And my time, too. What do you mean? I don't understand. Detective Gore, my mom was dying. She didn't have a chance. She'd been battling cancer for years and years. Then Dad died and everything got worse. Robert didn't blink. His spotlight stayed solely on me. Our lives got worse. Letting sympathy creep in, I watched Robert battle tears. Whatever tears could fall from that callous mind. Like a trained actor, Robert shook his head in dismay, battled the pain, all while keeping his voice at an audible peak. I couldn't let her go through another day like that, especially another Christmas. I stole a glance at the mirror, not willing to reveal my compassion. 
or the secret of Robert and mine shared sympathies. His situation all too familiar for me. She had to be let go. Robert went on. I had to free her. I know she's in a much better place. I confronted the killer. She wasn't your first, was she? Through the anguish, Robert revealed a sly smile. <laughs> you always knew. Knew what? That they were connected. He nodded toward the file. That I did all of those. Even if I'd suspected a relation, Robert confirming it still chilled me to the bone. Particularly the casual way he just confessed to well over ten murders. I felt my stomach twist in knots, struggled to suppress the anxiety. So you killed them, I forced out in a quivering tone. Robert continued smiling, as if he could read through my crumbling brick wall, straight into my fear. Correct. He motioned toward the file. I bet they're not even all in there. <laughs> In a stilted movement, I opened the case file. So, all these people... I showed Robert the photos I'd delved into hundreds of times. The vicious murders memorized in my mind. You murdered them. Moore stared at the collection with the reverence one has for a scrapbook. A trip down... A most morbid memory lane. Yeah. He pointed to the old southern lady. Gloria Deer. Use the pillow on her. Quick and painless. But why? Robert faced me. No, she was like my mama. He pointed at a photo. Terminal illness and not getting any younger. Somehow the mood was getting darker. A somber tension escalated. I pointed at another photo. The mentally handicapped Latino man. Dennis Carruthers. Bludgeoned to death. And him? He was just 19. Emphatic emotion taking hold, Robert waved at the grisly photo. I mean, look at him. No, that's no way to live, detective. He had Down syndrome. His whole life spent in shame being made fun of. I glared at him. No. That's disgusting. How- No. Robert slammed his hands on the table. A preacher in overdrive. I put him out of his misery. Just like Mama. Just like the dear lady. He pointed at the file. Just like all the others. The epiphany further unsettled me. Wait. So you're saying all of them had issues? They needed a mercy kill. Battling my fear, I looked at the photos. At each and every body. Even the ones without any life-threatening illnesses? Robert leaned in closer, drawing my gaze. They were all in misery. I looked on this man-made god, simultaneously horrified but intrigued. Almost impressed he got away with it for so long, and that none of us had ever made this chilling connection. But with Dennis Carruthers... Yeah, he was close enough. With a flourish, Robert waved at the other victims. There may as well have... All been on their deathbeds. The junkies and the paralyzed should have been in the ICU, too. Robert revealed a calm grin. <laughs> they may as well be dead. So, to you, these are all mercy kills. Smirking, Robert leaned back. I guess. He ran his hands along his arms, over the suit, sleeves, over his mother's own blood. Call me the mercy killer. There he was, right here in the police station, finally caught. 
but still my unease lingered. I stared right at him and his smirk. But why get caught? I placed my hand on the mercy killer's file, his catalog of corpses. Why now? It was time, was Robert's quick reply. His eyes didn't blink, never once shifted from me. You see, I was saving the hospital for last. Your mother, you mean? Robert's smile grew wider. <laughs> she was special, sure, but I needed more. My heart sank. Another epiphany was upon me, a personal one. Like a caring priest, Robert leaned in toward me, just inches away, his attempt at sympathy well on display. I know your mama wasn't doing well. I felt tears well up. Now I gave in to his horror. Anxiety dominated me. The shivering grew out of control. Christmas was about to get much lonelier. There was a lot of people there not doing well. He wouldn't blink. The mercy killer couldn't. I had to help him cope, just like Mama and I did. In an explosion, the room's door burst open. Both cops came rushing in, terror etched across their expressions. I faced them, faced the inevitable. Detective Gore, we have terrible news. One of them said, panic in his tone. It's your mom, the female added. It's most of the ICU. He killed them. With ferocious speed, I felt the mercy killer grab my hand in a death grip. I faced those great big eyes of his, that merciless smile. It's December 3rd. Robert's steady voice told me. Happy Disabled Day, Jill. Next up, it's the anonymous work, Alive in the Grave. This story features the vocal talents of As the Raven Dreams, Madame Raven, Nordic Vampire, Pumpkin Queen, Terra Talks, and, and Sitako. The Cemetery Caretaker and the ashen-faced, trembling young man make an odd pair as they stand by an open grave under the pale moon. In the grave itself is a coffin. The lid has been pried open, and inside, the corpse of a middle-aged man. The caretaker warns. Oh, I have heard about blokes like you, mm, read about grave robbers. I never thought I would come across one. Here, I've sent for the cops, young man. Don't you try any rough stuff. I'm a match for you any day. But you don't understand. I've tried to save his life, and now it's too late. Now don't you give me that. This fella was given a decent Christian burial. You've desecrated his. Desecrated, you say? Isn't it desecration to bury a man while he's still alive? Eh? Eh? What's he talking about? You don't think people go around being buried alive these days, do ya? I don't know what to make of you. I watched you this afternoon. I thought you looked a bit... peculiar. I didn't know what you were doing at a pauper's burial. He shouldn't have had a pauper's burial. He shouldn't have been buried at all. I could have saved him. You'd better think up a good story. Something told me that you were up to no good. N nah, don't you try any rough stuff. I already warned you. I watched you. The police are on their way. Breaking open a coffin like that. Yeah, I knew you were up to something. But I never thought. It's because... Because I let him get buried alive, and I was ashamed. I let him get buried alive for a measly 50 pounds. 
Now he's dead. Hey, did you come out of a loony bin or something? Now that I get a better look at ya, you, you, you do not look like no grave robber. I'm not... listen. What's he to you, this fellow we buried today? Nothing, except I'm responsible for his death. I touched him. He's cold. Cold as death. He's only been in the ground a few hours. They don't stay cold like that. Sometimes we get an exhumation order. We have to dig him up. You'd be surprised how cold they get. He is dead, isn't he? I brought this mirror with me. There's no breath. Look. <laughs> I do not have to look. He's been in the municipal morgue for two days. He's given a pauper's burial. Now then, what's this all about, young man? I want to go home. He was dead all right when they buried him. But not when the ambulance took him to the morgue. You see, I know. You knew. Oh, was he a relative of yours? I didn't even know he existed until two days ago. I'd been trapped in the streets looking for work. I didn't want to go home. If you can call that one room Lil and I occupy a home, it was still ringing in my ears the thing she shouted at me as I left there. I've come to the end of my tether. I've pawned everything. Look, even the wedding ring you slipped on my finger in the church. What did he say? And all thy worldly goods. Ha! Huh, that's a laugh. You were going to share all your worldly goods, were you? Well, if you don't get some money or a job, I'm walking out on you. Do you hear? I'm walking out on you and I'll go and live with my sister. At least I'll get some warmth and three square meals a day. Ah, uh, don't say that, Lil. Was it my fault I fell sick and couldn't work in the factory anymore? I've tried, dear. I really have. Everywhere I go, they look at me and say, no vacancies. Not my fault either. I warn you, I can't take much more of this. I know, honey. I know. I'll get something today. I promise. It was a promise I couldn't keep. Pounding the pavement, watching the dislike and fear in the eyes of the world as I passed by. Fear that one day they might become like me. And then I see him. I was coming to Duke's Lane, nothing on either side except a huge brick wall. He was a short, fat little man. Our steps blurred in the quiet thoroughfare. What was he stopping for? Was he taking caution? Did he think me a gangster or something? I suppose I looked like something that had crawled out of a piece of cheese. <gasps> Governor, are you alright? He can't be. He's conked out. There doesn't seem to be any breathing. I wonder who he is. He must have something in his pocket. Blimey, look at all this money. Must be 50 quid in here at least. Poor swine. What good is his money now? I'd better call a cop. Well, if you don't get some money or a job, I'm walking out on you. Do you hear? I'm walking out. There's nothing anyone can do for this poor swine. They'll find him soon enough. What does a guy do in a case like this? Beat it, you fool. Beat it with the first decent money you've had in months. Somebody will find him. Run! Lil. Joe? Joe, you got some money? That's right, Lil. Two five-pound notes, thirteen one-pound notes, and the rest in ten bob notes. It all adds up. Adds up very nicely. Fifty quid and all. Oh, Joe, honey. Why, oh, how'd you get this money? You didn't go do anything silly, did you? Just like what? Rob a bank? I wouldn't know where to start. But how did you get it? You'll never believe it. Remember I told you when I was in the sanitarium, there was this fellow there with the same lung trouble by the name of Ted Brown? Yes. Well, I lent him a quid. You lent him a quid? While I was... Well, I was still drawing my wages, wasn't I? We didn't know that the doctor wouldn't let me go back to the factory. It wasn't so bad then. All right. What about this Ted Brown? Well, I meet him in the street, see? He says he's been looking for me everywhere, wanted to repay me the quid. Go on. Well, we go into a pub to have a drink. There was a bookie there, and Ted says he has a hot tip, 50 to 1. It won, Lil. 50 smackers. 
Oh, Joe, 50 smackers. Oh, I love you. Lil went to get some groceries and a couple bottles of beer. I sat on the bed and had a further look at the wallet. Having taken the money out, I thought it'd be empty. There were two pockets, both with plastic windows. The first held a card that said Harold Maxted, 26 Fairley Street, Ornsby. Then I looked at the second plastic window. There were strange words printed on a white card. It said, I am not dead. I am subject to a form of cataleptic illness which may appear to cause death. If I am found, please inform Dr. Alfred Miller, Ornsby, 6641. No, no, it can't be. Not dead? Cataleptic? What have I done? Oh, what have I done? They'll think he's... I must telephone. But, Lil, she'll wonder where I've gone. I've given her all the money. Here, all right, I got a bit. Take these bottles from me, will you? Joe, what is it? What time is it, Lil? I don't know. The pub's just opened. I'd say about six-ish. Why? Give me a ten, Bob. Do you have any change? I need some silver. I have to telephone. It won't be long. What is it? I just have to telephone someone. You're not going gambling, are you? You haven't got the bug. You're not betting on tomorrow's races or anything like that, are you, Joe? There's all those bills to be paid. I know, love. I know. No, I'm not gambling, but I need it. Please. I'll be back in a little while. It's just that. Please, Lil. All right. Here. Joe! It's all right, love. Would I be too late with the phone call? Would they bury this poor guy without knowing he was cataleptic, thinking he was dead? This would be the number of the doctor in the wallet. Hello. Can I speak to Dr. Miller, please? Dr. Miller has gone abroad. He's been away for the past six weeks. Abroad? Oh, no. Have you taken over his practice, sir? No. No, I'm not a medical person. But if you're in need of a doctor, there must be plenty. No, no, it isn't that. You don't know which hospital Dr. Miller was at? I'm afraid I can't help you. I must go. My wife is shouting. Dinner is on the table. I'm sorry. Thank you. And then another thought seeped into my brain. Underground, a long wooden box and a man being buried. Being buried alive and a shovel heaping earth on the wooden boards. Oh, there must be a Maxted in the telephone directory. There was. Fourteen Maxteds. Everyone alive and bad-tempered. No, I don't have any relatives who suffer from a cataleptic illness. Perhaps there are a few other Maxteds in the book. Try them. I have. You're Mr. Zachariah Maxted. You're the last one on the list. Well, I can't help you. What now? Do I go along to the police and say, Look, I stole a man's wallet. Someone might be shoving him into six foot of earth. What do I do? I decided to sleep on it. Sleep? <laughs> That's a laugh. Uh, buried alive. Love you, Lil. Love, please. Pinching white. They're putting me in a wooden box, and it's your fault, Joe Ailish. I'm struggling for every breath. They're going to bury me, and bury me deep. But not deep enough, Joe. Get me out of this, or I will make you suffer, here on Earth and in the beyond. Death. I didn't know what to do. It had been less than six hours since I saw that chap fall. Maybe he's still there. Maybe if I go back to Duke's Lane, he'll still be lying there. Joe! Oh, sorry honey, I didn't want to wake you up. It's the middle of the night. Where are you going? I won't be long. No, Joe, you're not going anywhere. I thought you'd been acting strange. Oh, Joe, I know I've nagged and threatened you. But it's only because you are getting so down, so beaten. I love you, Joe. Otherwise you- It isn't that at all. All right, Lil, I'll tell you. Then you will see why I have to go. And so I told her. Told her the whole story of how I robbed a man I thought was dead. A corpse that had no use for the 50 quid in his wallet. So, you see, I have to go find him. Or find out where they're taking him. They will think he's dead, Lil. Oh, Joe, Joe. Somebody will have found him by now. He's probably lying in bed, fast asleep. People have these sorts of fits. They recover. No, they don't. After I found all the Maxteads I could, I went to the library and looked it up. Unless they get assistance, they can stay that way for days. By then, they will bury him. And you know what that makes me? 
a murderer. I'm letting a man die for 50 quid. Oh no, Joe. What if you phone the police station? What if you call the Onsbury police and tell them? Oh no, Joe, you can't do that. They will call you a thief and put you away. Look, I'm getting dressed and coming with you. Where did you say it was? Duke Slane? Joe, let's pray he's still there. It might be worse. He might have died for lack of attention. Let's pray someone saw him and took him to the hospital and they realized that he wasn't... wasn't... dead. Shh! A cop! It's a bit nippy this time of morning, isn't it? You're up late, aren't you? Yeah, that's right. There was a little commotion in Duke's Lane a few hours ago. My friend Phyllis told me. Something's happened in Duke's Lane. Oh, yes. Yes, just before I came to duty. Postman just broke lying on the lane there. Dropped that. Dead? They're sure he's dead. So the police surgeon said. Why? Know anything about it? We wondered if anybody we knew is all. Oh. Well, I believe they identified him, alright? If you need to run the station, they may be able to tell you. Oh, I don't think it's anyone we know. Come on, love. It's too cold to stand here chatting. Let's go up to bed. You two married? <laughs> you should have been in bed ages ago. Good night, or rather, good morning. Yes. Let's go to the police station. No, no, no. You have to entertain about the wallet. Besides, this policeman doesn't really know. But Lil... It's no good, Joe. We're going home. Come on. Some more coffee, Joe. No thanks, Lil. It's no good. We've got to go to the police. We're committing murder. It's two days now. I didn't sleep a wink all night last night. Kept having nightmares, hearing Max Dead's voice pounding in my brain. Pounding in my brain, telling me to save him before it's too late. Ailish, you're the only one that can save me. They're burying me this afternoon. They're burying me this afternoon. They're putting me in a coffin and covering me with dirt. If you allow this to happen, you are a murderer, Joe Ailish. A murderer. Do you hear me? You will be punished. 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 You will be punished. 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 He kept saying I'll be punished. But you said yourself, it's only a nightmare. All right, don't you go, I will. I'll say that I knew what his name... What was his name? Maxted. Harold Maxted. I'll say I know him and that he's a cataleptic. That's it, I'll go and... Excuse me. Hello, aren't you the young lady I saw down Duke's Lane the other night? That's right, I'm so glad you're here. You know we were talking about someone who dropped dead that afternoon. You were able to identify him? Yes, we were able to identify him, all right. Why? He's a cataleptic. He's not really dead, you know. Oh, don't be funny. I've got the card here. They're burying him this afternoon. He's in the orange by mortuary. Cardicophilia. This is the release of his body, for it to be buried. Signed by the police surgeon, Dr. Herbert Spencer. He may have been a Captain Palatic. I don't know about that, but he died of a heart failure. Being buried in a pauper's grave at Ornsby Cemetery this afternoon. Didn't die of a heart failure indeed. Huh. Not that. Maybe I'm being a bit silly. Thank you, Constable. G goodbye. Sure he's dead. The death certificate was signed by the police surgeon. What does that copper know about cataleptics? If the doctor he had known was a cataleptic, I'm gonna stop the burial. You can't, Joe. You can't! Once you tell the police about the wallet, where are you going, Joe? I don't know. To get drunk? I don't know anything anymore. Even my glass of beer went sour in my mouth. I had bought it with blood money, the blood of Harold Maxted. I left the pub and walked. They were burying him in a pauper's grave, were they? I didn't ask my feet to move toward the cemetery. It seemed they didn't belong to me. They were burying him as I got there. A minister, a gravedigger, and an old man. Obviously the caretaker, and the police sergeant. I wanted to shout, Don't! Don't put him in the grave! He's not a corpse! He's alive! 
I couldn't. Those three stripes on the copper sleeve seemed to represent a number of years I might get for stealing and withholding information. I ran from the cemetery as though I was running from the vengeance of Maxted himself. Hello, Joe. They buried him at last. I saw them do it. In a cheap wooden coffin. <laughs> Maybe it's a good thing the coffin was a cheap one. Maybe the coffin maker gutted it. Maybe there are holes in it. Maybe the poor swine will be able to breathe. Fifty measly knicker. Fifty rotten pounds. And I've turned myself into a murderer. I've let you in on it too. They will say you're part of the conspiracy. What have I done to you? What have I done to us? Nothing, Joe. All right, so you pinched his wallet when we were both starving. No one can have you up for... for, for murder? That's beside the point now, isn't it, Lil? He's down there struggling for breath, isn't he? He won't be struggling for long. I don't know anything about cataleptics, but you can't be nailed inside a coffin underneath six feet of earth long. Look out the window, Lil. It's gotten dark already. It's winter, Joe. I know the grave, Lil. I'm going back. Joe? You're not going to stop me, Lil. I'm going back, and I'm going to get him out of that grave. Please. Lil, I've got to. All right, Joe. I'll come with you. No, I couldn't bear that. I've got to do this on my own. Suppose... Supposing he's too heavy for you. You're not strong, Joe. It's a pauper's grave, Lil. They didn't take much trouble with him. Why a pauper? All that money in his wallet. That makes it worse, doesn't it? Maybe they couldn't raise his relatives. What with his doctor gone away and everything? Well, Lil, get my hammer out of the drawer. It's got that thing on the end for pulling nails out and that piece of mirror. All right. Here, I hope you're right. That you know what you're doing. It's the only way, Lil. The only way. And here I am in it, and it's too late. He's dead, all right. Blimey, young man. I wouldn't want to be in your shoes, not for nothing. Just a minute. What did you say this bloke's name was? Maxted. Harold Maxted. Oh no, it's not. Huh? This bloke's name is Sidney Frazier. Are you sure it's the same bloke? Positive. I know it's the same bloke. His accusing face follows me around sleeping and waking. Oh well, young man. Come and have a look with me then. We don't give them much of a tombstone, these paupers. There you are, Sidney Frazier, born February the 6th, 1920. Died December the 5th, 1967. I've told you everything. They've given him the wrong name. You better tell that to the police constable. I am sorry about this, young man. I warned you. I thought I was too old to take you on my own. When you started opening that grave, I ran to the cemetery office and phoned the police. Oh, well, it's almost a relief in a way. Hello, what's going on here? Oh, it's you again. Your missus was in a police station this morning with... Some nonsense about, uh, digging up a grave, are you? There's something fishy going on. When I told my sergeant that your wife came in, and we were burying someone who was, uh, cataleptic and who was not dead, he nearly strangled me. Said I should have taken full particulars. Said I owed to charge you both with causing public nonsense. This fella, Sidney Frager, has had heart trouble for years. Sometimes an ordinary hospital had a pleasure of his company. More often than it not was a prison hospital. Our police agent warned him he hadn't had long to live. Your wife comes in with a cackable story. We're burying him alive. As if we didn't know him. Sidney Frager. In his day, he was the finest pickpocket of Ornsby. Pickpocket? Yeah, well only the other day we have a complaint of Mr. Marstad that someone has stolen his wallet. Bloke accost him at the bus stop and started running. From his direction we knew it was Sid. <laughs> he picked Max's pocket. He wasn't a cataleptic, he was a pickpocket. <laughs> you better pull yourself together. And what are we doing here? And why is this grave open? Oh, oh, that's all right, Constable. 
Our young friend here got a bit mixed up. I opened the grave to show him he was mistaken. Then why did he ring the police and said that there was a suspicious character lurking in the cemetery? <laughs> well, it seems I was mistaken. That's all, Constable. In fact, we were both mistaken. Weren't we, young man? <laughs> Big pocket. <laughs> Cataleptics. <laughs> well, well, well. Someone should have told Joe Eilish that lifting wallets off cataleptic gentlemen is a most grave offense. In fact, it's likely to incur a most stiff penalty. Today's final tale of terror is Skin and Bones, an original work by Nerg Corneal. The story features the vocal talents of Madame Raven, Swamp Dweller, Tales to Chill the Bone, and a certain doctor. I don't like her. She's weird. Complains Travis, arms crossed and pacing back and forth. Look, bud. Answers Trevor, anxiously watching out of the living room window. I have to go to this meeting, or I could lose my job. Kim and I have been dating for a long time now. I really like her and wouldn't trust anyone else to watch you while I'm gone. It's just for tonight, and this will give you a chance to really get to know her. Who knows? By the time I get back to you, you two might be best friends. Doubt it, Travis replied. Trevor sighs and turns to his son. Travis, ever since your mom died... I didn't think I'd ever find another woman that I could feel this way about. But Kim is different. I really like her. And I think that we might actually get married someday. If everything keeps as good as it has been. I get it. You miss your mom, and I do too. But I've got to move on. I'm not asking you to like Kim, just because I do. I just want you to give her a chance. Please. For me. This makes Travis feel a little guilty. He hadn't really gotten to know her all that well but Kim really freaked him out. She was a very tall, very skinny woman that kind of reminded him of Momo. She had long black hair and a huge pair of eyes that looked like they could pop out of her head if she tried. Her face was constantly covered in heavy amounts of makeup, and she drenched herself in strong perfume to the point that he could literally smell her coming. To her credit, the few times that Travis had actually met Kim in person, she was actually very sweet and friendly to him, but her appearance made him extremely uncomfortable. Rolling his eyes, arms still crossed, Travis replies, Fine. Not too much later, a black car pulls into the driveway and a tall figure wearing a long fur coat steps out. As she comes to the door and rings the bell, Travis is immediately hit in the face with the strong smell of her perfume. Well, he coughs. It's definitely her. Be nice, replies Trevor in a stern voice. Trevor opens the door, and Travis can't help but shudder as he sees the image of this alien-looking person standing in the doorway, her huge eyes staring gleefully at his father, and then quickly to him. Hey, bud, Kim squeaks in a high-pitched voice. Are you having a fun night? Her smile is stretched wide, showing off her way too white teeth. Oh, yeah, answers Travis, unenthusiastically. Super fun. For a second, it kind of looks to Travis that her left eye twitches just the tiniest bit after he says that. Travis swallows hard. Trevor invites Kim inside and she gives him a huge extended kiss. Travis has to keep himself from gagging at the sight of his father making out with this strange-looking woman. Eventually... Trevor leaves for his trip, meaning that Travis was now alone with Kim, and his dread began to rise quickly. At first, things are relatively uneventful. Travis stays in his room playing video games, and Kim sits in the living room watching TV, periodically checking Facebook on her phone. Eventually, it was time for dinner, which, to Travis's delight, Kim just ordered a large pizza. They sat at the dinner table, and Travis was shocked at just how much pizza Kim had eaten. He often wondered if she ate at all, but she easily put away half the pizza within ten minutes. 
Travis wanted to ask her how she could eat so much and be so skinny, but he was afraid to offend her again. Hey, Kim? He starts. Yeah, bud? She replies, chewing on the latest slice of pizza she'd started on. I was just wondering, um, how it is that, uh, well... You want to know why I'm so skinny, right? Travis nearly chokes on his own slice. Uh, yeah, actually. Well, I have an extremely high metabolism, which means that my body burns calories a lot faster than other people. I actually eat quite a lot, believe it or not. But no matter how much I eat, my body just stays the way it is. Oh, okay. Travis feels really bad now. He feels like an ass for thinking she looked scary because of how skinny she was, and it wasn't even anything she could control. Sorry. Don't worry about it, bud. She says, finishing the last of her meal. I know I look funny, but it is what it is. As the night progressed, Kim and Travis actually started to bond pretty quickly. They played video games together, and then watched a scary movie. Eventually, it was bedtime, and after brushing his teeth, Kim bid him good night, and he crawled into his bed. After about half an hour, he realizes that he needs to pee and makes his way to the bathroom. After he does his business, he notices that Dad's bedroom light is on. Realizing that it must be Kim, an idea comes to him. Now, oh, Travis is a 12-year-old boy, and dirty thoughts as well as genuine curiosity began to come to him. He wonders if she's changing, or maybe even just completely naked. Maybe he could get a quick peek. He'd never seen a real naked lady in real life before, and he especially wondered what Kim looked like without clothes on. Sneaking close to the door, he slowly turns the knob. It's not locked, to his relief. Even slower, he opens the door a crack, just enough to peek inside. What he sees is not what he was expecting. Kim was standing in front of his mom's old vanity, but something was very wrong. Sitting on the table was what at first looked to be a mask, but soon became clear to be something sinister. It was Kim's face. Not just the face, it was basically her entire head minus the skull. Slowly and shakily, Travis turns his attention to Kim's head, which was literally a pale white skull. Travis didn't even care that she stood there completely nude like he'd hoped. He was too transfixed on the freaking skull with two large eyes. Travis then watches as she begins to remove her skin as though she were taking off one piece pajamas. She reaches inside of it and pulls out what appears to be a large sack. She takes it to the small private bathroom and Travis can hear her dumping something into the toilet and then flush it. She comes back folds the skin and places it in a large black box that was laying on the floor next to the video. Finally, she pops out her left eye and places it in a small bowl of water on the table. And then she does the same with the right eye. She turns off the light and then slowly shambles her way over to Travis' bed. Travis slowly closes the door and silently freaks out. Not knowing what to do, he slowly walks back to his room and climbs into bed. He does not sleep this night. The next morning, Kim gets Travis out of bed for breakfast. They sit at the table, eating the scrambled eggs that Kim had prepared before getting him up. No words are spoken at first, until Kim breaks the silence. I know you saw me last night, she says flatly. I don't, um... I don't know what you're talking about, responds Travis, refusing to look at her. Stop, she says sternly, freezing Travis in place. Just stop. I know you saw my face. My real face. I know you watched me. I thought it was my imagination until this morning. You're acting like you've seen a monster, and I need you to understand. You! Or a monster! Travis yells, cutting her off, immediately regretting that decision. 
Kim's face becomes sad. Look, bud. There's things in this world that you wouldn't understand. Yes, there are monsters in the world. Real monsters that would have killed you in your bag the second they suspected you saw them in their true form. But I didn't. Because I'm not a monster. <sighs> Am I human? No, not really. Do I mean you harm? No, I don't. But you need to understand that beings like me are not understood by regular people. So my existence has to stay between us. I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to scare you. But I will protect myself and others like me. Terrified yet understanding at the same time, Travis agrees to not speak of what he saw to anyone, ever. Later that day, Trevor returns, and Travis nearly knocks him over as he runs over and hugs him. Wow, bud. Trevor laughs. I've missed you too. Did you two get along? Travis looks over to Kim, who stares at him with a somewhat worried look on her face. Yeah. He answers, genuinely smiling. She's actually pretty cool. We had pizza, played some games, and watched movies. I like her a lot. He looks over to Kim, who is smiling brightly. Kim gives Trevor a big kiss and gives Travis an even bigger hug. Thank you, she whispers in his ear. Travis whispers back. You can trust me. I am trusting you too. And with that, Kim leaves, and Travis waves goodbye. With a newfound respect for Kim and new questions about what else is out there, he walks over to his dad to ask how his trip was. Well, my dear friends, I hope you like our first little get-together as a storytelling community. Um, I'll be back again with more stories from a variety of fantastic talents next Sunday and the Sunday after that. Please, please go and check out their channels. Give them all the support you can. I was a smaller channel not so long ago, and I really appreciated the help of other channels in getting started, so this is my chance to do the same. Go check them out, yeah? Well, I'll be back again tomorrow. So until then, very, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?